Let's do it again, now that we kind of know it and have a feel for it. And then let's all finish on the, the first part again, instead of the chorus. All right, this side starting again, this side following. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be here. It's good to see each one of you here. I want to welcome any visitors we have. And uh, a little bit of a smaller crowd after last Sunday at the wedding and had a really full house. But this is, this is good. I'm excited to be here this morning and expecting to be blessed. And, uh, yeah, just looking forward to what the Lord has for us. I don't have a whole lot to share uh, I appreciated Roger's devotional this morning, and I came in kind of on the tail end of it, but speaking about just, just trusting through hard times, through difficulties and tragedies, just simply learning to walk by faith and to trust in the loving God that we have. He's a good father. And this is something that I'm, I'm learning as I, as I experience different things through life. And I'm, I believe that, that hard times are really what form good, godly character. Uh, it is through tribulation and, and difficulties that godly character is, is so often shaped. And because of that, you and I are being molded and shaped more into the image of Christ because of these hard things. That is a result of, of those things. And so, and also I believe it has a tendency of, of turning our hearts towards heaven and, and to get us to long for something better than this life. If all that we have to offer is just simply the, the, the joy and the pleasures of this life, we are going to wind up and we will be very miserable people. And we see that all around us. We see that with people who, who have all of the money they could possibly ever spend. And they are mostly very miserable people. And so often their lives are ended prematurely by, by drugs, by suicide, whatever it is. And uh, very often it results in them actually resenting their wealth because they don't know who their true friends are. They don't know if these people are here just for the benefits of being one of their friends. And so, thankfully, I don't have to worry about that. So, I'd like to open it up for just a little bit. If there's anybody here who feels inspired to share something, an experience you had this week, go for it. The time is yours.
One at a time, please. Jeff, you look inspired. Were you fixing to say something? Go for it. Such a relief, isn't it? <laughs> Who knew that only Jeff would be able to take a plumbing issue and make a spiritual application out of it? You're glad you're you're a gifted man. Anybody else? Okay, pretty uneventful week it looks like. Well. If not, I don't want to take a whole lot of time from Brother Felix. I think he's feeling rather extraordinarily inspired this morning. So open your blue books. Let's all stand. We're going to sing 205 together. Victory in Jesus. Let's sing with uh, enthusiasm to the one who has died for us, the one who has claimed the victory. And uh, yeah, let's let's sing it with some enthusiasm this morning. Two oh five. Oh victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and sing another song then. <laughs> All right, let's sing 208. We've got the power. Maybe this will give you the power to share. Okay. 208. We've got the power. Satan, Ray. 
there is no name like the name of Jesus. And scripture tells us that the day is coming where every knee is going to bow. Every tongue will confess. And we can choose this morning whether we're going to confess that now or we're going to confess it later. But it, the promise of scripture is there that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And so this morning, I just, yeah, I'm just so grateful to be here and, and to worship with you. And simply sitting and listening to the preaching of the word is also an act of worship. Let's not, let's not minimize that. And so, yeah, we're looking forward to what God has for us this morning. And let's all bow our heads and pray. We'll lift up our brothers as we pray. Father, we thank you for this privilege. God, I thank you that we can be here this morning and expecting to be blessed and to be blessed. I pray, God, that you would minister to each one of us. Lord, we know that we're very needy and that we have uh, the opportunity to, to, be, to have those needs met each and every day. We thank you, Lord, that your mercies are new every morning and that as we humble ourselves before you and ask for your help, that you are always there to walk with us and, and to help us. And so, God, I just pray that you would use our brother this morning in a mighty way. Thank you, Lord, for his faithfulness and studying your word and for being a willing vessel to minister to us this morning. Just go with us and bless us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to say amen to what has been shared and to the words of the songs that we sang and welcome you to the further service. It's a great privilege to be with you and I am trembling a good bit because this message is one that I, about three times I was going to scrap it and choose something else. Um, I kept thinking, you know, I've preached it here before, and you might think you're tired of hearing this, this subject. And I just, yeah, I, I kept coming back to it, and I feel like it's what God wants me to share. And so, with God's help, I want to, I want to share it. Um, it's a little bit connected to the last message that I preached here, uh, which started out being a, a message on the home, but it sort of got into the territory of, you know, what, um, what do we do or how do we deal with uh, pain in our past and, and how that sometimes shows up in our, in our lives, especially as parents, and how it shows up in our marriages, and just in general how it shows up in our relationships um, as God's people. And just how we, how we deal with that and what we do with it. And I want to, um, I want to be very transparent and just look at the Word of God. And, and I want to look at the story of Judah in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. And I think he's, a, he's such an example of how to deal with, with pain in your life and how to work through it. There's so many applications in there. And uh, so I just want to, I just want to dig into that and see what God has for us. I think so many times um, as we're on this, this Christian journey, we have, you know, we've come to Christ for forgiveness for our sins and, you know, we're in the kingdom of God. But it seems like a lot of times we're still left with, with questions because Maybe we, we've received answers, we've received a measure of peace, we've received a measure of um, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to walk with the Lord. But it, it's like we're, a lot of times we're, we're sort of at a, either at a crossroads or at a, at a roadblock and it's like we can't move forward. And so sometimes, and maybe sometimes you just have a question, you know, what is God really like? And can I really know him at a deep level? And one of the deepest questions we often have is, am I loved by God? And 
What does he think of me? That's, that's always been a big one for me. What does he think of me? How are his thoughts towards me? And so I'm really drawn to the story of, of Judah. And in a lot of ways, maybe it's because we're, we're similar. Uh, incidentally, my dad's name is Jacob, as was his. Um, I'm the fourth child in the family. He was also. And he had older brothers who had really serious relational problems with their dad. Same here. And he was called upon as a younger brother to be the spokesman for the other brothers. And a lot of times I was too, whether I wanted to or not. And so I, I, I can sort of identify with, with Judah. Let's go to Genesis 35 and begin there. We're going to do a fair amount of reading, but I, I, for the sake of time, we're not going to be able to read all these passages, obviously. <clears throat> Genesis 35, and... <clears throat> In verse uh, 23, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, and Levi, and Judah. So we see there that Judah comes in fourth, Issachar and Zebulun were his younger brothers by the same, by the same mother. And then Jacob had uh, six other sons with Rachel, two with Rachel, and two with Billa, and also, too, with Zilpah, who were his, his concubines. So, <clears throat> why, why was Judah the spokesman? Well, Reuben had sinned against Jacob, against his father, by, by having uh, sexual relations with his concubine. Simeon and Levi had each also created a, a big rift with their father when they deceived and slaughtered the whole village of Hamor and, and Shechem where they were avenging their, their sister Dinah's um, defilement and um, they did that and it very sorely displeased Jacob and it created, it seems like it created a, a, a very strong rift in their relationship and so these boys, the sons of Leah they had I guess a very strong awareness that their mother was unloved and I believe that they translated that as we are unloved. And so we have in that setting, we have Joseph, the son of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. And the Bible says that Jacob showed Joseph favoritism. We're going to read that in verse 37. I mean, chapter 37. <clears throat> in verse 2, it says, These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Billa. And with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Okay? This is what the scripture says. And I want to be careful today that I don't... Uh, apply my thoughts to the scripture but the scripture just gives us the facts here it says they hated him because Jacob loved him more than his brothers and I, I want to say this carefully Jacob is one of the patriarchs he was he was uh, very very used by God very instrumental in in God's program God appeared to him in visions he had numerous encounters with God. He wrestled with the angel. Um, very, very instrumental in God's plan. And we could say, well, he himself was also a victim of favoritism because, as we know, Isaac preferred Esau. And so it, uh, Jacob was probably also had some pain in his life from that. And so, but he, he was, I guess he was blind to the fact of how, how he was hurting his older sons, or his, all of his other sons not, that were not the sons of, of Rachel. And I just want to make the point, 
godly people are sometimes blind to what they're doing and the hurt that they're causing. And I, I, I think every one of us as parents or as, as leaders or just as, as Christians, we're many times we're blind to the hurt that we cause. And I think that we really need to seek the Lord and ask him to show us, Lord, is there something I'm doing or is there something I'm saying or is there, is there a way that I'm behaving, a way that I'm conducting myself in my relationships that are causing pain or that are, that, that are wrong and, and I'm causing undue hardship to people around me and ask God to show us whether that is the case. But I believe we can agree that it was the case here. He was blind to the pain that he was causing. And so <clears throat> these boys grew up in that environment. They hated Joseph. Now, was it okay for them to hate Joseph? Well, no. But I think it's an example of how a sin, caught, a sin uh, committed against somebody created sin in them that came to a boiling point. And so that's always a possibility in our lives. There is a choice we can make. We can choose to forgive those that have sinned against us so it doesn't create bitterness, so it doesn't create resentment. So it doesn't create anger and all this stuff that's inside of us that someday is going to come out. And someday is going to go, go looking for an outlet. And someday is going to look to hurt somebody else. It's going to happen if we let it stay there. And so we read on in the narrative how Jacob sends Joseph out to feed the flock. Or out to check on his brothers who were, who were watching the flocks. And... We'll read just a little bit of the narrative there um, in verse 18 of chapter 37. When they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. It goes on to say that Reuben said, No, let's not do that. Reuben was the older brother. And I think he felt responsible in this case to do something about this. He felt that even though he himself probably didn't care for Joseph, he didn't feel like this was justified. And so he stayed their hand, but I'm not sure what, what happened that he wasn't there. Um, but anyway, somehow Reuben was gone. And then in verse 26, And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. Now I, I, can, I can see what Judah was thinking here. Judah's thinking, Yeah, Reuben, we'll take Joseph back to dad, but it won't take the problem away. There'll still be that enmity and that hatred there. And so Judah's like, I'm going to solve this problem once and for all, but we're not going to kill him. Because he, he himself could not bring himself to see his brother killed. He wasn't quite that full of bitterness. But he saw a solution here. He says, let's sell him. And let's do this. And, and that way he's out of our hands, problem solved. We'll tell our dad, you know, this is what happened, and we're done. And so that's what they did. But I just want you to notice that Judah was the one who had the idea. And he was, he was the de facto leader of his, of his brothers in this case. And so they do that. They go back. They tell their dad, you know, this is what happened. And they see their dad grieve. But they, kept, they were sworn to secrecy. They said, we're, you know, nobody, nobody broke the secret. And for years, for decades, they kept this secret. Then we go to chapter 38. And this is a chapter that just all of a sudden it breaks into the narrative here. And as I study it, I'm not real sure how the timeline works out. Because to, for this to all play out, it seems to me like it would have took at least 20 years. Because Judah, it says, goes to, we'll just go over the high points here. In verse 1, Judah went down from his brethren and turned into a certain Adolamite whose name was Hira. And... I'll basically just give you a rundown of, of the story here. Judah goes to this Hira. He finds a wife among those people, this, this, this village of other people in the land. I also want to note that Judah, this is Judah's story. I don't know what the other brothers did, 
I would imagine they did something similar because they all needed wives. And, you know, so they probably went to the, some of the surrounding villages to find their wives. It talks about them as having little ones, so I'm, I'm assuming they were all married men. But in this case, it's talking about Judah. He goes and he marries this woman, and they have three sons. And it says the first one um, married a lady named Tamar. And, but he was wicked in the sight of God, and God slew him. I think there's a little bit of a lesson there. There's, here's Judah. He's a man who has done wrong, and he knows it. He's a man who's carrying guilt. He's a man who's carrying a guilty conscience every day because he knows what he did to his brother Joseph. He knows he was the leader. It was his idea to do it. And I can imagine every day he's thinking about his brother Joseph and the way he pled with them not to sell him, not, not to do this to him. But he's, he's gone, and he's, he's over there doing this thing. He's kind of running from God, so to speak. And when God kills his firstborn, I believe Judah knew something was happening here. And it shook him. Well, according to the Leveret custom of that land, a very ancient custom, if, if a man who was married died and they were childless, his brother needed to marry his widow to, to raise children for his older brother. And so, in keeping with that custom, Judah gave the second son to Tamar. He did that which was evil in the sight of God, and God killed him also. And so now Judah's thinking, boy, this is really serious. You know, stuff is really catching up with me. And he had a younger son, but he's like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to. He, he said, Tamar, just go home and live with your, with your folks. I'm not going to give him. And Tamar did something very, very interesting to us, very um, terrible. It's, it's, it's kind of a, a very embarrassing story if you read it. And there's sexual sin. And Tamar becomes pregnant by Judah because she posed as a prostitute. And she had twins. Or I'm I'm running ahead of myself. Judah, uh, yeah, he had relations with her as a a prostitute. He just saw her beside the road, didn't know who she was. And she required uh, some of his personal items, his signet and his bracelet and his staff, and then bring me a kid from the flock. And of course, They came back, and she wasn't there. They asked the locals, where is she? They said, well, there was never a prostitute there. Anyway, it's found out later that she's pregnant, and and, and they said she's pregnant by whoredom. And so Judah says, bring her out that she may be burned. And so I just want to point out there again, when we have sin in our lives, when we have a guilty conscience, we often become very judgmental and very severe in our judgments. And that was the case with Judah. Well, she was, she was wise enough to bring these things or to require them in the first place. She brings them and says, by the man who these are, I am with child. And Judah, to me, this is a turning point in his life because he says, she is more righteous than I because I did not give her my youngest son up as I was supposed to. I, I, I refuse to do that. But I think in his, in his statement, she is more righteous than I. He had come face to face with his sin. He'd come face to face with who he was. He came face to face with, this is who I have become because of carrying the the bitterness and the guilt that was a result of the pain that I was carrying. This is who I have become. And this is is not good. And I think it was a a turning point in his life because the next thing we see is Judah's back with, with Jacob again. And so moving along to chapter... But in chapter 39 and 40, it's all about Joseph, and I'm not trying to just skip over that because Joseph's story is the major narrative here. And Joseph, by the way, is a type of Jesus. And, you know, Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph was mistreated, misunderstood, um, went to a, a, a foreign country. Jesus came to earth, you know, left his place in heaven. So many things there that where Jesus is a type of Christ. Everybody, everybody agrees Jesus is a type of Christ. He's, a, he's a, the one who provides for us. The one who went to the far country and he is raised up. He is, he is he's glorified. He's a king, but he is our provider. 
And so Joseph was that for his brothers, even though they had treated him terribly. And so we go through this, this story, and again, it's tracking with Judah here, but also bringing Joseph into the narrative, because it's very important that we, that we have that. <clears throat> I make sure I'm not missing anything here. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm going to go to verse 42. Jacob, uh, Joseph had gone through all his trials in Egypt. Pharaoh had put him over because he interpreted Pharaoh's dream. He had put him over uh, administrating all the the harvesting of the grain, bring it into the warehouses, and now the time of famine has come. And in chapter 42, verse 1, it says, Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do ye look one upon another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence, that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, lest peradventure mischief befall him. I got a question for you. Jacob had not changed, right? So he was still showing favoritism to Benjamin. He was still pre preferring one of the brothers over all the others. He was fiercely protective of Benjamin wouldn't send him down to Egypt to get corn with his brothers. Why did the brothers not hate Benjamin? Was Benjamin just a nicer boy compared to Joseph? It just transferred it, right? He lost Joseph and he transferred his favoritism to Benjamin. Although I think they were both very, very favored even when Joseph was alive. Right? But why didn't they hate him? The circumstances were the same. You think that's why? Well, you may be onto something that I didn't think about. That's possible. Yeah, that, that was sort of my conclusion, although I don't, I don't disagree with what you're saying, brother. Um, they were carrying a tremendous load of guilt, and they knew that what they did with Joseph did not take care of the problem that they had. And they acknowledged, I believe, that a big part of the problem was theirs, because they had allowed the pain of that sin that was committed against them to make them bitter and to make them hateful. And they had seen how far that hatred could have took them, could have taken them. I want to use proper English. They saw how far, they saw, they felt the rage at seeing him and the bloodlust that they were willing to kill him. Some of them were. I'd say the majority of them were. If it wouldn't have been for Reuben and Judah interceding, they would have killed him. That was how deep their hatred ran. And I believe that sometimes it takes us seeing in our heart how dark it's in there before we stop and realize, hey, there's something wrong here. It's not just about the person that wronged me. There's something wrong in my heart, and I need help. And I think they recognized that, but they didn't know what to do about it. And that's a bad place to be, having guilt, having shame, having that just eating away at you but not knowing what to do with it. It's a bad place to be, but that's where they were. They go down to, the, to Egypt, and they run into Joseph. Joseph recognizes them right away. He sees that they're his brothers. And what does he do? This is, this is so interesting to me. Remember, Joseph is a type of Christ. So their need, and this is, this is, I think this is a really interesting application. Their need drove them to Joseph. Our need sometimes drives us to seek the Lord because we see how dark it is inside. We know there's something that we need. Our desperate hunger drives us. It's like we need help. 
We need something. There's something missing here. And so we go. And we're looking for him. And he, said, he saw him coming. And God sees us coming, too, in the midst of our need. But I think when God recognizes something, it has to change in our hearts first. You know, God is so merciful, and he's so loving, and he's so kind. But he knows what we need. Joseph's brothers needed to see truth. They needed to understand things. They needed to be tested. They really needed what Joseph did. And so they come there, and they run into this unusual experience of being treated like spies. And it was strange to them. It's like, why are we being treated this way? We're just buying corn. Why is everybody else not being treated this way? Why is this guy singling us out to be rough with us? And notice that... Um, <clears throat> He says this in verse, verse 42, verse 21. And they said one to another, We are very guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. They put into words what they had been thinking all this time. But all of a sudden, something happened. And they said, This is, this is happening because of our sin. This is happening because of what we did. And Joseph hears them. Isn't that amazing? You know, we don't always know. We don't know Jesus, but he knows us. And he, he hears them. He understands them. And in verse 24, he turned himself about from them and wept and returned to them again. I just get a picture of Jesus here when we're in the, mid, in the middle of it. We're still not, we, we still aren't seeing the light, but he's working on us. And it's like, I think it's like the, song, the songwriter says, uh, Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Sometimes God seems severe. Sometimes he seems unkind. Sometimes it's like, what are you doing with me? But he wants us to learn the lesson. He wants us to get through the trial. He wants us to understand where he's taking us or see, you know, get, get to where he's taking us. And so they go through this thing where... He, he was rough with them, but he finally sold them the corn. But he kept Simeon back there because he accused them of being spies. And he sends them on their way. But he restores their money. And now they really freak out when they get back to where Jacob was. And they're like, something's going on. This guy treated us this way. He put our money back in our sacks. We don't know what's going on. But he kept Simeon there. And he said, we can't return unless, unless Benjamin is with us. And Jacob, you know, he's tore up. He's, he's, you know, this is terrible. And so Jacob is still hanging on to Benjamin. And in chapter 43, and the famine was sore in the land. And it came to pass, when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little food. Now I want you to notice Judah again, what he does. Judah steps in and he intercedes. In verse 3, he says, The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. If thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will go down, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. Notice what Israel says, what Jacob says. Wherefore dealt ye so ill with me as to tell the man whether ye had yet a brother? Now, if I'm in Judah's situation and I've still got that pain of rejection, this statement from my dad would probably just really make me go off at him. Right? Because it would, it would trigger that pain. It would make me angry because he's still showing favoritism and he's blaming us now when Joseph had asked them he already explained that but he doesn't he just continues his narrative he says dad this and this and this is the way it is and this is the way it has to be we're not going back Simeon's still there do you think he's going to let Simeon go if he told us 
you got to bring your younger brother. And he finally convinces him. He intercedes with his dad. He finally convinces him to let Benjamin go. And he says, I will respond for him. I will be surety for him. I will personally stand for him. And so he's the intercessor. And I'm not sure. <laughs> There's probably some spiritual applications there as well. But Judah, he's standing, he, he's standing and speaking for his other brothers. And he's saying, this is what we have to do. And so he goes, and he convinces his dad, they go back down, and they get there. See, we're in 43, Let's see where we can break in here. Um, in verse 27, and he asked of them of their welfare and said, is your father well? the old man of whom you spake, is he yet alive? And they answered, Thy servant our father is in good health, he is yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obeisance. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spake unto me? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother. And he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber and wept there. Again, a picture, a picture of the love that God has for his sometimes rebellious children and sometimes hurting children who are on the way back. And I, I just love this picture because he knows them. He knows them. They're his brothers. And they're coming back. And it's just an expression of just the great love. I believe it's the expression of the great love that God has for each one of us, especially as we're journeying back. He loves us regardless, but as we're coming back, it's like you're almost there. And you're going to get it. You're going to understand it. And I'm going to show you. And we're like, well, I don't understand. His, Joseph, his brothers are bewildered. I don't understand. Why is he treating us this way? Why are we going through this? It must be that, that thing we did and the guilt weighs down. And we tend to be the same way. We've got the pain. We've acted out. Now we've got guilt on top of the pain. And we don't understand. And he keeps taking us along this journey. And Joseph continues. And he does the ultimate trial where he, he treats them nice this time, but he puts his cup. He has his steward put his cup in Benjamin's sack, sent them on their way. And then he tells the steward, chase after them and tell them they've stolen my cup. And I want you to notice something else. Now, I forgot to mention this earlier. You notice that throughout the narrative earlier, they kept saying, we be true men. I, th I forgot to point that out earlier. When, it, when, they're, when they're responding to him, they're like, hey, we're good. We're good guys. We're not spies. We're true men. Isn't that the way we are so many times? We've got a guilty conscience. Somebody comes to us and says, hey, what about this and this and this? Oh, what are you talking to me for? I'm, I'm not that way. I'm an honest person. Why are you? We react. We fly off the handle so quick when that conscience is already bothering us. Because we don't want, we've, we're already hearing it from our conscience. We don't want anybody else to agree with that because we're tired of hearing it. And so they're that way. But now, when this happened, when this happened with, with Benjamin, Verse, verse, chapter 44, verse 11. They speedily took down every man his sack to the ground and opened every man his sack. And he searched and began at the eldest. Notice how he's trying to build suspense. And left at the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. And look what they did. They rent their clothes and laid at every man his ass and returned to the city. I think at this point they were done. They were like, this is, something's going on here. We don't know what it is. But we are done. And Joseph said unto them, This is the ultimate trial. What deed is this that ye have done? Wot ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? 
Notice what Judah says. What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. And Joseph takes it a little bit further. He says, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Notice what Judah, the intercessor, does here. Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ear, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. I don't have time to read the whole thing, but you read this whole thing. It is a touching, just a pleading for his younger brother, who his father was still showing favoritism to, who could have been a source of pain, but it wasn't anymore. He lays down all his dignity, all his resistance, and just says, I can't let you have him. Take me. And after Judah was done, Joseph was convinced that they were where they needed to be. Joseph was convinced that his brothers had come to see the truth. They'd come to see what they needed to see. They were truly broken. They were truly repentant. And they were ready to be reconciled. And then it says, Joseph could not refrain himself before them. And he cried, caused every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known to his brother. He wept aloud. And the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And I want you to notice, especially in verse 4, because I think this really, really applies. It speaks to me. Joseph said unto his brethren, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. You know, I think when we're at the place that God, through the Holy Spirit, knows, we see the light, we see the truth, and we are... We are humble before him. We are broken before him. And we're ready to hear the truth. Then he says, come near. Get close. Because you're mine. You're my brother. I am your brother. And I think sometimes we, we, we run. We don't want to be close because we're afraid. We're afraid of what God's going to tell us. We're afraid of what he thinks of us. We're afraid of... You know, the way we've been, the way we've acted, the, the sin that's been in our life. We're afraid of the failures. We're afraid of all these things. We don't know if he approves of us. We don't know if he loves us. And he says, come near. There's another beautiful example of this in the story of Elijah. When Elijah's on Mount Horeb, you know the story well. The prophets of Baal had tried to call down fire from heaven, they, and they didn't succeed, and they cut themselves, and they did this. All this time. And then it says Elijah built the altar. And he had him, uh, no, first backing up. After the prophets of Baal were done, Elijah built the altar. And then he tells the children of Israel, come near. And I believe in both of these examples, you see the heart of God to a people who has, have been rebellious, to a people who have allowed sin to grow in their lives, to a people who have turned their back on, on God. Because, for whatever reason, and, and Jesus, through the prophet, Jesus through Joseph, is an example. He says, come near, get close. And I, I feel like that is, the, that is the gist of the message this morning, is Jesus yearns for you to know him. He yearns for you to be close. He understands you better than you know. Just like Joseph knew his brothers and they didn't realize it. 
and he calls out to you, he reaches out to you, he takes you through stuff that you don't understand, but it's got a purpose, <clears throat> it's got a reason, and it's, it's his plan. There was a great reconciliation with Joseph and his brothers. And he told them, you know, go get dad. The famine's yet going to be for several years. Bring him down here. Bring your children. Bring everybody down here. I'm going to provide for you. You're going to be well taken care of. And that's a picture of God inviting us into the kingdom, into close relationship with him. Going from now forward, you'll be provided for. You're going to have what you need. Is the Christian life always easy? No. But if we're walking close with him, if we're not afraid of him, if every time we're in a trial, the first thing we do is look up and say, I don't know what's happening, but I trust you. If the pain comes back and we're triggered again and we're in the depths of despair, and the first thing we do is look up and say, Lord, it's hurting, but I trust you. Get me through this. I know we'll get through this. And refuse to lean on our own understanding or allow fear to just overwhelm us. If we'll do that, he'll continue to go with us and he'll continue to lead us into truth. I think it's so sad in a way, and it's kind of a picture of how we are because there's a, there's a little account later on in this, in, in, in Genesis, after Jacob dies, now Jacob, um, he dies in chapter 50. <clears throat> and in the last part of chapter 50, in verse 15, it says, When Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us. And will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command us before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespasses of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. You know, I think God's the same way. Because they reconciled. But somehow, even though Joseph told them, I forgive you, we're good, and he showed them all that provision, and they were able to live there for all these years, there was still doubt in their mind. And that saddened Joseph so much that they were still afraid. And I think God is sad when we are afraid. And we fear that we have fallen out of favor and that we're not good enough, that our performance isn't up to snuff, that somehow we're not doing enough for him. And we, and we are, again, afraid. And my prayer and my, my desire this morning is that as believers, we can just draw from this that he is for us. Yeah, we have to deal with sin. Yeah, we have to come face to face with it. And sometimes he takes us through processes that are difficult. But he's for us. He's not against us. He loves us so much. And let's just believe that. And let's continue to walk in that. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the example of Judah and Joseph. I thank you for the scriptures and the way that there's the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's the terrible failures, the sins. But there's also the redemption and the beautiful story of your love. And we thank you for that. We pray that you would, by your spirit, communicate that to each heart here. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have a song.
see the last two verses, verses three and four. Have thine own way. Can we say amen? amen? That was a, yeah, just a real deep and inspirational message. I've heard you preach that several times, Felix, but I think that one takes the cake, so that was good. I had several thoughts as I think of, you know, the brothers, they separated themselves from Joseph. You know, if Joseph is a type of Christ. He didn't want to be separated from them, but they separated themselves. And also, after, because they, as a result of being separated from him, they didn't recognize him. And they also, even after they knew who he was, after he had revealed himself to them, as Felix read the last verse there in chapter 50, um, because of that time of separation and because of the guilt, they... They didn't really trust his character. And, uh, but yes, I, that's just a wonderful story. I, and that's a true, I think we need to be reminded it's true that the Bible is made up of histor it's a historical account of things that actually did happen. And uh, we have it today for our benefit. Um, so yeah, just a very moving message. I'd like to open it up for anybody who'd like to share.
Thanks for sharing, Joseph. Thank you, Levon. Anybody else? Okay. Um, was somebody going to share? Did I cut somebody off? No. Um, as far as announcements, we don't have a whole lot. This week is a, an open week. I think some of you need that to recuperate from a busy week last week. Um, but we are planning on having uh, Paul Hostetler is going to be here for a weekend meetings October 24th through the 27th, I believe it is. And so just remember that. And then also we're planning on communion. Do you know the dates for communion? We we posted them. I don't know. Okay. All right. Yeah. Communion is coming. Uh, any other announcements? Okay, we have Sam and Chris Fisher and their family here this morning. They've been attending for a while and they have asked to, for membership here. And so we're going to give them an opportunity. I know their children are really excited to get to share their testimony this morning. And so we're going to give them that, that chance. So we'll, we'll start maybe with Sam and Chris and go through the, the children. So.